Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to talk about four API architectures and protocols that we must all know. Uh, every system that you are going to design will obviously have one or the other type of API. Uh, and APIs follow different types of architectures and different types of protocols are supported. So knowing the underlying structures and when to use what and what are the pros and cons, what are the different structures of the API, when to use what kind of a scenario is very important when you are either giving a system design interview or it can definitely be asked in any of the companies or if you are also designing a system in your job uh, it's important that you understand which api structure and which api architecture and protocol best suits your uh, architecture needs so uh, without much ado let's uh, move forward so the first api uh, type was rpc so rpc is called a remote procedure call which basically is a way to call functions on another system. So one system calls a function on another system. It's very tightly coupled in that way. So if you think of RPC in that way, and let's consider a client and a server, let's see how the communication is. The communication primarily starts uh, by a client, invokes a remote procedure, serializes the parameter and additional information into a message and sends the message to a server. On receiving the message, the server deserializes its content executes the operation and sends back a bulk request to the client. And the server and the client stubs, those are the primary uh, areas which serializes and deserializes the parameters. Uh, so that is a basic high level uh, way of how RPC calls are made. Uh, RPC, there are several pros and cons of using RPC. Uh, the pros are, it is very simple to interact. All right. Uh, if, when you already know the function, it is very simple to interact. It is high performance because it, it is not very heavy on the payload and it is easy to add functions. So it's, it's e easily you can add more functions as per your new feature requirements. However, there are some cons also, uh, like it is very tightly coupled between the client and the server because it is dependent on that exact function definition. No parameters in the API. So uh, like in other API standards that we will see, uh, RPC API, since it's a direct function call, you cannot basically give a query parameter, for example, in the API. So those things are not supported, so which is a con. And it is easy to explode. Uh, easy to explode means since it's just adding a function and clients can directly call that function, it can uh, a lot of times go beyond hand where if it is not uh, reviewed well. So, which is where RPC is lightweight, but it can explode a bit. Uh, there are various implementations of RPC. Uh, RPC is just a standard, but there are different types of RPCs. Uh, JSON and XML RPC are the two most common. Uh, JSON RPC uses JSON for ex uh, encoding and XML RPC uses uh, XML for encoding. Uh, although XML makes it a bit more difficult. Uh, and but those have been the standard process uh, of using if you are implementing RPCs over the period of time. Uh, but recently there has been some development on RPC and um, gRPC is uh, something that was developed by Google uh, with a pluggable support for multiple features like load balancing, authentication, etc. And then there was Apache, Apache Thrift. Uh, Facebook developed it. And the main benefit of that is it is language agnostic. So which is another benefit so that is rpc the next api architecture that we are going to talk about is uh, soap soap is also a very old api architecture and protocol which has been around for a long time like rpc uh, soap is simple object access protocol it is a xml based communication and it supports various uh, protocols like http smtp tcp etc a client server communication in a soap api so it looks something like this so like we mentioned, the API communicates over various protocols like HTTP and the client and server uh, communicate between each other. But the main thing to note here is in the in the message uh, in which the client and server uh, talk to each other. That message is has, since it's an XML based message, it has a very specific format. So the message format primarily contains four components. The first component is the envelope, which is mainly the envelope of the message. It, it binds the message with tags and other data. Uh, then there is header. Header is again a metadata of the request that is being sent uh, where you can provide authentication details, IP address, client informations. Uh, 
then there is body body is the main request or response structure that is being uh, sent by the client to a service and then the server responds back and then there is fault fault is the the errors that will happen during the processing of the request so these are the four main component of a soap api message so every api that you implement in soap because those are in xml those have to follow this very specific message format again soap also has several pros and cons uh, the pros are obviously it has it supports various protocols like we mentioned http smtp tcp so various protocols are supported the message format has inbuilt error handling so you don't have to uh, you have to you don't have to uh, be concerned about missing error handling or fault uh, handling so that is inbuilt and uh, soap also has several security extensions so which is which is which is very very good uh, and then there are cons in in a soap api architecture uh, the first con is it is xml only it doesn't support other formats like json and since xml is a markup language so there can be several injections that are possible uh, and because of that so the soap api logic is written in uh, wsdl which is which is web service description language uh, which basically means that the api description language defines the endpoint it describes the process that can be performed uh, and that is where it is very structured and since it is in xml format so it the the request and response can be very heavyweight so basically there can be a lot of data which may cause the xml files to be to be very huge in in size and it is also very difficult to debug uh, uh, because of the of the way so the client and service uh, corresponds to each other another thing that i should have mentioned here is uh, soap is supports both stateful and stateless messaging so which is a big plus uh, soaps this rigid structure can also be a benefit at times uh, obviously in conjunction with uh, the several security extensions these capabilities make it very suitable for enforcing a formal uh, uh, software contract between the api and the client uh, while also complying with say legal contracts between the api provider and the api consumer right so in these kind of in this premise uh, soap is a api architecture that is very much used in the financial organizations because of the a very concrete structure there is a uh, contract in place there are security uh, 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 extensions that are possible so those that is why soap is uh, very suitable for financial organization users the next api architecture that we will talk about is one of the most popular api architectures that is there today and that is mostly the one that is used today almost in every appli i'll not say in every application but in a lot of applications and that is rest rest is it is called representational uh, state transfer basically it is a set of guidelines for implementing scalable and lightweight apis uh, basically to make data available as a resource so remember in rpc we were directly calling a function right but uh, in rest you are making data as a resource the rest uh, architecture looks something like this uh, basically you have multiple rest clients and there can be multiple rest services and the clients can talk to the apis in the service via http methods uh, http methods are the types of actions which are defined by rest uh, which means get means get me this data right uh, delete means delete this data so what is the type of action that you want to do on the api endpoint using certain kind of request and response which can be either json or xml so that is the that is a very typical architecture of a rest api uh, but one good thing that you can see is uh, the rest clients and the services are are not very tightly coupled those are decoupled right and the service has a very uniform structure which is where different clients like for example website or mobile app or some other clients can all all talk to the same service so the so the api has a very uniform structure and those are the kind of guidelines uh, that is set actually we'll go through the guidelines also so the architecture principles which are the guidelines are uniform interface like i mentioned you define uh, uh, 
uniform way of interacting with the server regardless of the device or the client application right uh, client server decoupling yeah so uh, the clients and the services each of them are allowed to independently evolve without the dependency on the other right uh, statelessness statelessness there is no need to uh, handle any state of the data uh, and the necessary state to handle the request as contained uh, is contained within the request itself uh, without the server storing any related uh, information uh, uh, for the session uh, then there is cacheability yeah it is it supports http so uh, it has some inbuilt cacheable uh, components so which is a benefit although we do also tend to implement extra cache layer on our service side but it is still there http provides that and it is a layered system right uh, however there are uh, several pros and cons for rest also uh, the Okay, before going to the pros and cons, let's look at the request format. REST also has a request format, uh, but the request format is not exactly the, the request body. Uh, the thing that we spoke about during SOAP, it's exactly the, uh, the message body. But here it is the request. So whenever you are implementing a REST API, that will have an endpoint. The endpoint is basically the destination URI. URI is a uniform uh, resource identifier. URLs are uh, uh, one of the most common uh, uh, parts of URI. That is the endpoint which will be called. Then there are methods. Methods are the HTTP verbs like which defines the action types. Like I mentioned, get, put, post, delete. So those are those are the HTTP methods. So whenever you call an API, you have to provide the endpoint, the HTTP method. Header is again metadata around various information about the request and the body, actual body in itself. Uh, that's a request format. Now let's look at the pros and cons. Uh, the pros are, uh, like I mentioned, client and server uh, are decoupled. It is cache friendly. It is very flexible. So those are all pros. Uh, uh, there are certain cons. Uh, there is a possibility of big payload because obviously uh, if you have implemented a REST API or if you are going to implement, you will see that the way you define the structure, it is possible to provide a huge API payload back in the api itself so which is where applications or large scale systems uh, they actually limit the api size on the service side right uh, so that they don't stall on the size of the api there is no single defined structure basically there is no right way to build the rest api right uh, it's completely up to the implementer or the developer to define that api how it will be which gives the flexibility in the first place but obviously it does not give uh, like in soap it is very structured so but in rest it is uh, it obviously uh, can go via different which is where you need a lot of uh, communication you need a lot of contracts specifications for the client to actually integrate with the service which is kind of a can be a painful uh, sometimes and one of the biggest uh, drawbacks of rest is it only supports http or https uh, it doesn't support tcp or smtp uh, that is a disadvantage, but depending on the use cases, uh, REST is one of the most popular API standards and principles and protocols that is used to implement any kind of microservice or any kind of application. And the last one is, uh, is one of the most new API architectures uh, and protocols that was defined not more than I think five, seven years back. It's called GraphQL. So GraphQL is a graph query language. Uh, like you might know about SQL, which is structured query language to query data from the database. It's exactly similar. You basically query structured data from a service. So that's GraphQL. The, the, the communication pattern between a client and a service in a GraphQL uh, QL API looks something like this. The client requests uh, data from the service via the GraphQL uh server uh, the main thing to note here is how is the graphql server directly getting the data from the database so basically what graphql starts with building a schema a schema is where you define all the queries and the the structures of what kind of data that you want from the service uh, which is where uh, when a client directly requests the data from the graphql server uh, if the data is directly available from the DB, that data can be directly fetched from the DB and given back also. Uh, 
or it can also call an API on the service to get back the data from the service. But now there are certain pros and cons uh, and the pros here are that it is a structured schema. So which basically means that the client can actually define what are what is the type of data that it is wanting from the service. In a REST API, the client only calls the API that is defined by the service. The client cannot pick and choose what to get back from the service. But that is what GraphQL basically supports. Even if an API is written to respond back say five different fields, uh, GraphQL client can define what fields they want in that API. So that gives it kind of a flexible uh, data schema kind of a structure and that gives uh, primarily the clients the handle to fetch data and accordingly build their client applications irrespective of how the service is providing the data. And there are obviously several security extensions also possible. GraphQL is one of the newest API architectures and protocols that is there today. However, there are certain cons also uh, like uh, caching is complex, like primarily um, we have to build custom caching layer uh, in Graph GraphQL, so which is where it is a bit complex. Uh, performance issues are there at times and there is a huge learning curve uh, because of the uh, amount of knowledge that there is for REST or SOAP and RPC which have been around for like decades. Uh, GraphQL is very new, it's, it's less than a decade, I think probably five or seven years like I mentioned and it was actually uh, developed by Facebook. So uh, which is where the learning curve is huge and if you have to use GraphQL, uh, generally companies don't spend that time to learn. If you already know and if you are aware of GraphQL, how it operates, that is where uh, services can directly go and start and it definitely gives uh, benefits uh, to how you want to build an API. It's a forward looking API. Folks say that that is the future. Uh, but REST is what most of the APIs and microservices talk between each other and that is the REST uh, API architecture. By the way, one thing uh, is a API that is implemented as, as a REST API is also called a RESTful API. So if you hear somewhere that uh, it's a RESTful API, that basically means that it, it follows the REST API architecture and pro uh, the protocol will be uh, HTTP because REST only supports HTTP. So hopefully these are the four uh, API uh, structures primarily and API architectures and principles and obviously in each of these architecture like for example RPC there are three or four different variations of RPCs like we mentioned. So hopefully this was useful. Thank you for watching.